So we were talking about this second approach where we uh, defined a new abstract data type uh, but we're able to use inside the new type uh, the, ty the abstract data type that we had already implemented which was counter. So we defined new counter to and used counter in the definition of the of uh, new counter too. So if we just look at an example here, a, a C++ implementation of this, uh, and let's just start here in our main program. So what the main program does, it uh, uh, declares a variable C of type counter, then it calls the reset function and sends C as a formal parameter to it. So we're using one of the functions that can ma manipulate this abstract data type. Then we increment it twice and then we write, write out what uh, value it has by calling the get function. Then we declare a new variable called nc2 which is of type new counter2. And the very thing, the first thing that we do is we call a function called reset num reset, which resets the variable that keeps track of how many times the uh, new counter has been reset. We'll look at this in a minute. And then we call the reset function of uh, and send nc2 as a variable to it. So that's th that reset function has similar functionality as the reset function for that accepts counter as a formal parameter. And then we increment our uh, nc2 variable three times and we write out what value it has. Then we reset it again and increment it twice and again write out what value it has. And then finally uh, we write out how many times it had been, has been resetted. So remember the difference between new counter2 and counter was really just uh, that we added uh, a variable called numReset to the counter, which keeps track of how many times our, our new uh, counter2 data type has been reset. That, that was really just the, the only difference between counter and new counter2. So Counter hasn't really changed. The interface for counter is the same. Um, and the implementation for counter has not changed at all. But we have now added a, an interface for new counter too. And how does it look like? Well, here is the representation of the type. It includes a member variable that is of type counter. And then we have this num reset value. Notice the in, in the slides it says int num resets equal to zero. Uh, C++ does not me does not allow me to initialize a member variable in the struct, so I can't do that here. And that's actually the reason why I have a special function which I call reset num reset, which simply just sets this num reset value to zero. <coughs> the other functions are are uh, same as the one that we had for the counter variable. We have a reset function, we have a get function, we have an increment function. Um, and uh, we have a uh, function called how many resets. Um, in all these cases I'm uh, sending or passing by reference for the get and how many resets I would I guess I don't have to do that because uh, the functions don't change anything but uh, it's harmless anyway it's uh, sending it past reference is uh, quicker anyway anyway because if if I do it by value then it means that the struct is being copied. 
So let's just keep it this way. Um, so in new counter two, we have uh, the reset operation, which just calls the reset function in f uh, that has been defined for counter because this one takes a counter opt, uh, counter abstract data type or, or value of type counter. The get function just returns by calling get with a counter value. The increment just increments by calling increment with a counter um, value. So all of these simply call the these three functions in counter that are also associated with the abstract data type counter. Uh, reset num resets sets its own num reset to zero. That's this reset num reset value here. And finally, how many resets simply returns that value. So if we go to the main program again, uh, the C counter is incremented twice and should have the value two. The new counter is incremented three times, so it should have the value three. Then it's reset and incremented again. So after that, it should have the value two. That's what should be written out here. And finally, how many times did we reset it? Well, we reset it two times, first by this call and the second time here. So we should get out printed, uh, the, val the values printed should be two, three, two, and two, how many times we reset it. So if we compile this, simple counter has value two, new counter has value three, then new counter has value two, and how many resets? Yes, two times. So everything seems to work. We have built in C++ a new abstract data type that is able to use in its definition. Uh, the data type that we had originally written. Uh, so this was, as we said earlier, this was a better solution uh, than the previous one because we're able to uh, reuse the code. But the problem was that we had to explicitly call the get and the increment functions inside our new get and increment functions, even though we are not changing anything. And the reason why we had to do this is because we didn't have any inheritance mechanism. Now, so another problem here is that how can we handle in a uniform fashion the values of counter and of new counter? For example, assume we are dealing with a series of counters. Some are simple, so some are of a type counter, others are enriched, uh, so the others are of type new counter too. And assume that we want to reset them all to their initial value. So we could, for example, imagine that we have an array of counters, you know, 100 counters, and we want to reset each element of this array to its initial value. So the first thing that we would like to do is, uh, uh, is to declare a, a such an array. But then the question is, what is the type of such an array? We could say counter v of 100. Uh, so in that case, we were declaring a, a variable v of size 100, and, and each element type is, is counter. But would that be sufficient for us? Would that handle this problem? Uh, no, because we cannot store new counters twos. We, we can, cannot store values of type new counter two in this array because counter and new counter are of different types. They are, they are two distinct types. 
And of course, the same thing happens if we declare this array of type new counter two, then we can't store uh, the values of type counter there. Uh, so in order to be able to solve this problem, we need some kind of a compatibility between these two types. And that's something that the abstract data types doesn't give us. So what do we mean by a compatibility? Uh, we can say that a type T is compatible with S, with type S, when all the operations over values of type S are also possible over values of type T. So if you think about new counter 2 and counter, then we can see that all the operations over um, uh, the values of type counter are also possible over values of type new counter. So new counter is compatible with counter in that sense. So new counter 2 here is, is the type T here and counter, and counter is the type S here. So all the operations over counter are also possible over values of type new counter 2. Uh, but as I said earlier, the problem here is that the abstract data type is not flexible enough to allow this form of compatibility. Um, and we can actually see this if we go, go back to our example in our main program. Um, I have defined a variable v uh, of size 2 here and it's of type counter and I can store of course uh, the variable c in v of 0 because the variable c is of type counter so there's no type mismatch here but if I uncomment this second statement here and I try to put the the, the variable or the value of the variable nc2 into v of 1, then the compiler complains because it then tries to convert new counter to a counter. So the compiler uh, is of, of, of course statically analyzing or doing uh, static type checking and you can see that I'm trying to put into an array a value which is not of the type that I had been that I had declared the array of. So there's a type mismatch because there is no compatibility relation here. The abstract data type is not flexible enough to allow me to do this. If I uh, comment it out again, then everything is fine. So let us now assume that new counter 2 is actually compatible with counter and let us assume that the language permits us to have a vector declared as a counter but I'm able to store both uh, uh, values of type counter there and values of type new counter. If we were able to do this then I would be able to perform this uh, loop here. Looping through the whole array from 1 to 100 uh, and reset each value there. And uh, what I would like to happen is that the num reset fields of new counter 2 have been incremented by 1. Why is that? Because new counter 2, when it the reset method of new counter 2 is called, it will increase its num reset value which is the second member variable in the struct. So it would call the reset function by using the counter value and then increment its own num reset. Now if um, if uh, I had a um, value in the vector that was of type counter, then of course the reset uh, function would be called with 
in, in the abstract data type for counter, which is this one here, which simply just sets the counter to zero. It doesn't have a num reset variable, only new counter has a num reset variable. That, that was the whole purpose of defining our enriched uh, counter. Uh, but here again, even though this is something that we would like to happen, this would not happen because the reset operation defined in new counter uh, would not have been executed, only the one defined in counter. Uh, and the problem here, if we go back, is that the compiler uh, associates statically uh, uh, the, uh, this name reset to a particular function. And what function is it? Well, it must be the function in the counter uh, abstract data type because the variable v has been declared of type counter. So it's, de it's clear that it is of type counter. So when we do a reset call here, when the compiler sees a reset call, well, then it says, well, okay, this must be the reset function in the abstract data type counter. It can't be the one in in uh, a new counter tool because this is solved at uh, uh, this overloading is solved at uh, compile time. So what we can say here is that uh, compatibility, if if we had a language that were able to do this, uh, to put uh, both new counter two and counter into this array, then compatibility have solved the problem of of uniformly manipulating the values of the two types, but in a certain sense has destroyed encapsulation, allowing the application of an operation to a value of a type new counter, which is not correct with reference to the ADT. Uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, we mean by this that if we have values of type new counter in, in this array, we were actually executing a function in counter. So, destroying the, uh, destroying the encapsulation because the function reset was defined for the counter abstract data type we're running a function reset in the out counter data type, but not the function reset for the count new counter2 data type. So this is the problem. We really ba and the, the main problem from this that, that we can the main take home point here is that we are not able to execute the f reset function in new counter 2, only the reason f reset function in, in counter, because uh, of the static solution of the overloading of the function. As we said earlier, the compiler uh, statically associates this function call reset to the code in the counter object even though we would be able to put both counters and new counters into this array.